We will begin the presentation in just a few moments. And while we're waiting, I'll just do a screen share there. There we go. Good evening, everybody. We're going to give everybody a minute or two to populate the event. Nice, robust numbers joining us. Okay, and we're streaming on Facebook as well. We are going to begin this presentation in just a few moments. Uh, my name is Lisa Salberg, founder and CEO of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. Today, I am pleased to be joined by two members of our team, Stacey Titus and Julie Russo, who will be going off screen in a minute, and they will be taking care of any of your technical needs through the webinar, through the um, chat box. If you have any questions for our presenters, I ask you to use the Q&A box. Technical questions regarding webinar access or HCMA services can be done in the chat feature. Julie and Stacey, thank you very much. Okay. Um, I am joined by two really good friends and faculty members. Um, we've known each other a really long time. So first tonight, we have Dan Jacoby, who wears his hat of cytokinetics these days. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we lost him to industry, but we still are happy to have him on the HCM team. So Dan, welcome. Thanks very much, Lisa. It's, it's fun to be here. I think the last time I was on webinar with you was, uh, was also Cytokinetics, but maybe the time before that was as a Yale uh, COE kickoff or something like that. I think that's exactly what we were doing. Yeah. And we have Dr. Martin Marin joining us from <clears throat> Leahy. And y'all know Marty, if you watch any of the HCMA content, we do a lot of uh, entertaining and educating through podcasts and webinars. So Marty, thanks for being with us tonight. Always great to be here. Um, so um, good to see you, Dan. Um, thanks for joining. And um, thanks for all the patients and uh, family members and uh, HCM community tuning in. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to give a quick disclaimer tonight that the information provided in this presentation is for informational purposes and is not intended to treat or diagnose any disease. If you're interested in learning more about clinical trials discussed in this session, do not hesitate to contact a study coordinator or the sponsor. Contact information can be found at clinicaltrials.gov, and we'll be dropping some links for uh, clinicaltrials.gov directly into the uh, chat box soon here. Um, or you can go directly to our website or the sponsor's website. The HCMA provides this information session to ensure that patients, caregivers, healthcare practitioners, and interested members of the public are informed on inclusion and exclusion criteria and the uh, and the clinical trials fundamental scientific basis. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share right now, and I am going to ask uh, Dan if he would show us his slides and kind of walk us through where cytokinetics has been, where we're going, and this is going to be a conversational evening, so Marty and, and Dan might talk through some of these slides as we go through. I may throw in a couple of comments here and there, and we will spend plenty of time on Q&A, so feel free to drop as many questions as possible. Dan, the mic is yours. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, and thanks, everybody, who's taking the time out tonight to <clears throat> or today, depending on your time zone, to join us. I mean, it's a great opportunity to um, just have a chat and see what we can, uh, we can learn. Um, so, you know, I'm representing uh, Cytokinetics. Um, and... At Cytokinetics, I am a medical monitor. Um, I am a senior medical director in the research and development um, department at Cytokinetics. What that means is a lot of the stuff that I learned when I was, for the 20 years that I was a practicing um, doctor, many of which, 15 of which were heart failure, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and genetics, um, the work that I did there in research, clinical trials, and basically taking care of patients with all my time really is now the effort to translate that into meaningful medicine for patients living with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So to be honest with you, I mean, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm new to this and I uh, work with an amazing team at an amazing company. And uh, I, I hope that my my dreams are realized to help you realize your dreams, which is to get, get new medicines to help everybody live the best life they can live. 
And that's the that's really what's behind Cytokinetics. Our mission is to bring forward new medicines to improve the health span of people with devastating cardiovascular and neuromuscular diseases of impaired muscle function. Um, this is a disclaimer. It's the truth. Afficamptin, which is what we're going to be talking about, is an investigational agent. It has not been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration yet um, or any regulatory agency. And the safety and effectiveness of this product has not been established, although that's what we're going to be discussing. Um, and it's actually the work that you as a community put in that brings these medicines that you know, we discover the effectiveness of them and brings them to, to being able to be used. So, you know, it won't be news to anybody here about the burden of this, this problem. And the reason I like this, this graph here, figure here in, in particular, is because if you look at it, you know, you say sort of now, here's, you know, kind of an estimated burden of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Burden is a technical term that we use in, in healthcare to estimate the, the sort of you know, sort of uh, cost to the system, but this this is the this is the population that that's known about. But if you look at the future, this is not because population growth actually. You know, and and Dr. Marin, you pointed this out. I'm going to call you Dr. Marin tonight, as I pointed out. Dr. Marin, you 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 pointed this out to me when we were looking at these slides that you know really this is because of improved recognition, but through the work of the HCMA and other organizations, and improved imaging and improved de detection techniques. Um, and so what we're looking at in the future is more identification, it's not because of more disease necessarily, but it also means that we can then help more people. Uh, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, I'm just going to full disclosure here. These slides, these slides, I'm responsible for them. Not exactly the perfect slides that I would have wanted to talk to this community, but I'm, but we're going to, I'm going to use all the skill I have, try to tiptoe through and, and kind of give you the lay of the land. Um, you know, what this is, what this slide is telling you is that the very first research study that we did on this molecule, it's called Redwood HCM, the very first research study in people with HCM. And we're going to tell you a little bit of the results of that. But let me tell you why we actually even thought that this medicine, Afcampton, would actually be helpful in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's actually a direct inhibitor of the overactive element in the heart muscle cell called myosin that drives hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that direct inhibition leads to, I'll say normalization. I don't really know if it's actually normalization, but it moves in the direction of so-called normalization of cardiac function. And so the thinking is, if you give this medicine, some of the symptoms and some of the effects of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will be improved. And so this was tested in the way that you have to do it. If you're, in, if you're trying to develop a molecule to give to patients, you have to look at what the appropriate doses are and you have to identify a population that's in need of help. So here we have patients who are symptom, have symptoms with gradients that are greater than 50 in this case and a bunch of different doses that people tried. So this, this, this may make your head spin, but the really important point of this is that if you look at the green and the blue lines, they go down and the gray line stays flat more or less. The gray line are the people who received sugar pills and the blue and the green lines are the people who received afficamptin. And what these lines tell you is what the gradient is. So it's starting off, the gradient is around 50 to 60. And after a couple of weeks of treatment, the gradient is down below, 50, below 30 in this case. Um, there's two different graphs here because one of them is with Valsalva or with exertion, mimicking exertion. And the other one is at rest. So this study kind of told us that, wow, you get a really good result using all these different doses of afficamptin in lowering the gradient. So what else? Well, there's a bunch of other things that changed. And we looked at a lot of them. And thank you to the patients who participated in this study because they had to have blood draws to look at circulating indicators of stress on the heart. One of them is BNP and that went down and also had to be evaluated by the doctor multiple times. <clears throat> Talk about their symptoms and you can see over the course of this study, that an increasing number of people had what's called New York Heart Association Class 1. Many of you know what this means, but it basically means that you don't have any more symptoms. It also, what this is really telling you is that patients improved by at least one step on this scale at 64% of the time in this group and at 43% of the time in this group. So a lot of good news 
from this early study looking at different doses of afikimtin. Now, we know that there are multiple different kinds of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Can I, do you mind if I ask you if-, if, if I, I would I, love it. I was just thinking I was hearing too much Jacoby voice. Go ahead and hit it. No, if it's okay, maybe just, if we could just pause for one thing, go back um, to that first slide about the gradient going down. I just wanted to make the point here, if I can, for everybody listening, you know, most of the patients obviously hear when they go to see their cardiologist, they hear a lot about the pressure gradient, right? Pressure gradient. It's a number that they hear a lot as they do the visits. And one of the most important points in HCM is that the pressure gradient, which is the obstruction, is what is the most important reason why patients get frustrating symptoms, shortness of breath, decreased exercise tolerance, chest pain. So those very frustrating symptoms, which can often be daily in patients, is related to the pressure gradient being high, that obstruction. And, and it's really important to, to emphasize here that afikamptin, as you pointed out, pretty remarkable. You know, if you look at that first graph, which is the which is just looking at the pressure gradient at rest, yep, starts pretty high there before the drug is given. And then within a very short period of time, it's essentially abolished. Two weeks. Yep, exactly, within two weeks. And what I mean by abolished is that kind of dotted orange line Everything above that is high pressure and everything below that is no, pre no pressure gradient. So you go from high pressure before the drug to essentially getting rid of it quickly. And, and, and that stays, that pressure gradient stays normalized, abolished throughout the time that the patients were taking the drug, 10 weeks. And then when the drug is stopped, what we saw was that that pressure gradient went back up to where it was before they took afikamptin, what's called that washout period for two weeks. So I think it's just important to show how, it, how, how dramatic and how impressive the drug was able to essentially obliterate these pressure gradients, which we know themselves are the major determinant of symptoms. So I'll turn it back over to you. I just wanted to kind of emphasize that very acute reduction, continue to get rid of it, and then it goes back up when you stop the drug. Maybe I could, you know, before I dive back inside, maybe, you know, Dr. Marion, let me ask you, you know, you've seen patients, you've seen lots of patients, obviously probably more than almost anybody else, with these high pressures, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you've seen patients who, after the high pressures are, are removed, are gone. I mean, do people get back? I mean, I, I kind of have my own impression about this from my own practice, but I'm curious your thoughts. I mean, do people get back to completely normal life after those pressure gradients are gone in general, in your impression, in your experience? Yeah, I think the, 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 general, the general principle is that when the gradient is eliminated, that patients really can be restored to normal or near normal quality of life. Okay. It's really dramatic. It's almost, I, I talk about it in terms of night and day difference between high pressure gradient and no gradient, okay? Gives patients the opportunity to then engage life the way they want with really without being held back by those limiting symptoms. And so that's a, it's a huge, huge principal point. Uh, pressure is so important in being responsible for making things so frustrating for patients that when you get rid of it, they're happy. All right. Well, that's really helpful. I, I'm going to, you know, I may actually jump over a couple of these, but I do want to just spend a minute on this other type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then kind of, I, I want to just tell you where the, where we're going with the program. And then we get into more general discussion. So just a couple more of these. Um, you know, I think it's important to note, and you guys are all aware, everybody's aware, 
that this pressure gradient that occurs really only occurs to the point of causing symptoms in about, it's about two thirds of patients on average. That's what the published data tell us. And, um, you know, when that, when that doesn't happen, is it true that everybody just feels completely fine? I'm sure there must be people watching this webinar who don't have uh, a pressure gradient, but still have, you know, symptoms from their hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so we call that non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or NHCM, you know, it's the terminology that's used. And so because of the way that afficantin works, that it directly, directly kind of puts the brakes on the overactive part of the, of the heart muscle cell called the sarcomere, but really directly acts on that. It has the potential to potentially make the heart a little more relaxed as well. And we think that some of the symptoms from this so-called non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy derive from the heart just being too stiff. And so the possibility exists that afficantin may help this population as well. And so, of course, again, you have to try it in different doses and see whether it actually does anything and, and how safe it is. And so that's what this study is. It's another cohort of the same study. And Again, a lot of data, a lot of figure here, figures here. Um, but I think instead of going through, I, I think I'll ask Dr. Marin again, do you want to give your impression overall of what these kind of results are telling us about how Afghampton works in this, these patients who don't have obstruction? Sure. So, you know, for those listening who have non-obstructive HCM, uh, you can be limited and very frustrated by symptoms. As I'm sure you know, because you're living with that disease and it's very, very frustrating situation. And so we have less treatment options actually for you, as you know, which means that there's an even greater unmet treatment need for the non-obstructive HCM in a way. And so what we're seeing here is even in some ways takes on a great importance in terms of possibilities, potential here. Because what we're looking at, if you focus for a minute, and this is looking at Afficampton, again, targeting the muscle in non-obstructive HCM, to kind of improve relaxation, filling, efficiency. And over 10 weeks, what happened then to non-obstructive patients? If you look at the middle, the busy graph, but the most important thing is to sort of make the point that half the patients, more than half, who took Afficampton with frustrating symptoms from non-obstructive HCM over a short period of time, 10 weeks, had a significant improvement that they reported in their symptoms. We don't have another drug available right now that can do that at this point like that. So that's, you know, that's obviously something that, you know, when I look at that generates an enormous amount of enthusiasm and excitement for the possibility here of improving life, quality of life for non-obstructive HCM patients. What we see too, to the left of that, the first graph is just again, this point about what happened to a blood level in, the, in these patients that represents high pressures. That's the, the BNP. That's just a, a certain protein that reflects high pressures in the heart, which again, are part of what non-obstructive HCM patients have. They have high pressures because the heart doesn't relax that well. So you can see that those high levels are present before patients took the drug, but then over two weeks, those levels come way, way, way down, demonstrating real effect of the drug at lowering pressures reflected by a significant decrease in BNP levels. Okay. On the far side, it's kind of a similar blood marker called troponin, 
different blood marker. Kind of, again, we look at that as reflecting the, 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 the stress on the heart muscle in a way from these high pressures, showing you those levels to be high before taking afficamptin, coming way, way, way down after only 10 weeks. Again, demonstrating and supporting the idea that something important is happening in the heart muscle that's beneficial. And that translates into how patients are feeling, which is that 50, more than 50% better on afficamptin over the 10 weeks. That's the summary here. Uh, thanks, Marty. I mean, I, I think that the one thing I'm going to, I'm just going to plow ahead. And I'm just going to let you guys know um, that these studies, these studies that we're showing you are really what we would call phase two studies because they're really smallish numbers of patients, 20, 30, 40 patients and short periods of time two, four, six, 10 weeks. And it's really encouraging to see all this. That's the word that Dr. Marin used. Um, but obviously this needs to be verified. You can't, you know, we can't say, okay, well done, you know, great. Let's, let's, let's get this medication out to people because, you know, you have a sense that it might be effective. You have a sense that it looks pretty safe. No adverse, you know, no discontinues, discontinuations due to adverse events, no significant problems. But that has to be tested in a bigger study and it has to be tested over a longer term. Okay, so what you get is after that, after you participate in these studies, to look at this over a longer term, we have another study called the Forest HCM study. And basically these studies, what, what we do is we have these studies open to anybody who participates in a either phase two or phase three study, because we wanna know, we, we, we feel that people participate in the study, we wanna to continue to give them medicine if they wanna take it. And we wanna make sure that the benefit, if we see benefit, that that benefit extends over time. We wanna make sure that the benefit doesn't just go away. You know, okay, you feel good for 20 weeks or what happens next, or it gets worse again. No, we wanna follow it out. So this study is, now we have over hundred patients and it could go up to 300 patients or more. Um, and the study duration is, you know, fairly long. And, you know, people stay on the drug and they come in and get checked every so often for safety and anything that's going on. Um, and so these, these studies, you know, we have a bunch of data here. I'm not gonna walk through the whole thing. It's just to say that the, the benefit of these dr drugs, at least so far, okay, again, we're in the, we're not approved. It's a preliminary phase where we're looking at this, but the benefit is Vafacamptin is ongoing to 48 weeks, benefit in New York heart association cash, the, the drop in the pressure gradient, okay, even the patient reported symptoms. And I don't wanna get into all, I think it'd be too much actually. Dan, I do have I'll a clear question uh, yeah. coming from the audience. Can you just explain the patients who are in forest, um, are they taking beta blockers, calcium channel blockers? Are they strictly on AFI? What is the makeup of that population? Great. Um, thanks for that question. Um, so actually the patients who were enrolled in these studies were on good medical care such as we have it, which includes beta blockers for apamil. And we even have a study including patients on disopyramide, which is a not as commonly used, but still relatively frequently used medication, especially for patients with obstructive HCM. And patients stayed on those medications while they are in these research studies with one exception. So in the forest study, which is the long-term study, patients and providers were given the option to come off of their so-called background therapies if they felt like they were doing well. So a beta blocker, rapamil, whatever you have you. I love beta blockers so much. Uh, I detect a bit of sarcasm. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, patients were given the option to come off those. And some patients did. And the patients who did continued to do fine off of them. Now, I, I don't want to get, I mean, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. You know, people take beta blockers for a lot of reasons. Atrial fibrillation is a common reason. Ventricular arrhythmia is a common reason to take beta blockers. Obviously, if you have those things, you have another reason to take beta blockers. These were people who were just taking their beta blockers because 
they were trying to treat their obstructive, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so once it's being treated by Afcampton, in this, you know, some cases, the investigators and the patients decided to stop it. They stopped it. They seemed to do fine. Again, preliminary data, but suggestive, right? Encouraging. Um, I don't want to, again, I don't want to get too bogged down in the slides. I'm just going to tell you right now, and I think this is really a focus point, that we are in the most exciting time for Afikampton right now, because we are enrolling our phase three study, which is the big study that tells us really definitively, does this molecule actually help people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the way we hope it does? We're enrolling patients into this study. And in fact, that study has a lot of patients already in it, but there's still time for patients to enroll in that study if they would like to. There's not a lot of time and there is a certain restriction on it. So let me, let me just say that uh, if people are interested to learn a little bit more about this, there are ways to do so and we can provide you with some of those ways. So one of my great team is gonna drop a link right now in the chat box and one on our Facebook page that'll bring uh, those who are interested directly to clinicaltrials.gov where they could identify the sites that are currently open and recruiting and they can contact those sites directly to get more information. I'm just gonna show one more slide and then I, I, what I really wanna do, I wanna stop with the slides and I just wanna have a conversation. I wanna flip to the conversation. I'm gonna jump yeah, ahead. Yeah, that's questions coming in, they're, they're coming. Yeah, so I, I wanna switch and I, again, like, you know, I'm well aware after 50 years of life that there's such a thing as too much Dr. Dan Jacoby and so I'll, we'll <laughs> shut up after a while. So um, this, this is the last thing I wanna point out, which is that, you know, very quickly um, on the heels of Sequoia, which is our phase three study, which again, if you have obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a gradient and you have symptoms, it's still enrolling, particularly if you're not taking a beta blocker right now. You should look, look into that if you're interested. But we have, because of that, because of what I told you before about the fact that we observed that some patients were able to come off of their verapamil or beta blocker and so on and feel actually well, the next, we designed another study to look directly at whether patients could just take afikamptin as monotherapy, meaning it's the only drug they take for their obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or the other group will be taking beta blockers, which is right now the standard of care. And actually, there we all are aware, obviously, that, that afikamptin is not the only cardiac myosin inhibitor out there. There's mavicamptin, camzios, which is available commercially. But all the data we have for both CAMSIOS and for Afcampton at this point is all on top of background medical therapy, okay? We don't have any extensive data about using it as monotherapy or in comparison with beta blockers. So that's what this study is gonna help us with. And to be honest with you, I'm super excited about it because it'll be the first time we've ever been able to try to tell patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy what, it, what beta blockers do officially in a randomized blinded fashion over a large population. So this study is going to be enrolling. It'll be coming. Keep an eye out for it. Um, and it's very similar in structure and in timeline to the Sequoia study, 24 weeks. And it's for patients with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And keep your eyes peeled in the future. We'll also have a study coming for your non-obstructive patients who are symptomatic to follow on top of that data that Dr. Marin was telling us about and talking, describing from the Redwood study. Basically another opportunity to see if Afikamta can really help in patients with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And with that, I'm gonna to flip to the last kind of summary slide. Um, I'm proud of this. Um, this is you know, it's one of the reasons I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing, although I miss my patients tremendously. Uh, but I look at this and I say to myself, you know, what are we doing here? We're trying to look piece by piece at helping the entire spectrum of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so that ideally we can find a way to help every patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy one way or another. And that's the mission. I'm dedicated to it along with a huge team of people and I appreciate the opportunity to go through some of this work today. 
Yeah. Thanks for, for starting off the conversation with a good platform here. We do have a lot of questions coming from the community. Um, let me just click my view over here. Okay. Um, what I'm hearing a lot of is a little bit of confusion out here. So I'm going to ask some kind of basic questions to set the stage and you'll understand where we're coming from. Um, no questions or bad questions, people, but it does help me figure out where you're all coming from and where we're starting. So one of the questions that was asked was, can you get a prescription from Aetna for this drug at this time? So can you just take a moment and explain the approval process and where this agent is in the process to, to, to be able to eventually answer that question? Yeah, I mean it it's it's the right question, right? Like when looking at that thing, listening to listening to Dr. Barrett talk about the data, I was like, this is amazing. So so I mean I, it's the right question. Um the, the truth is though, um the approved United States is one of the I mean the FDA is the best organization in the world. Um it's the model organization for helping us understand how to safely and effectively evaluate drugs. So that when they get to patients, they do what people say they're going to do, and they don't cause problems. And honestly, we have to go through those steps step by step. We're doing it as fast as we can. Right now, we're in the phase three, which is the final step. Once the Sequoia study completes enrollment and every patient has completed all the visits, we will get the results. If those, And that, that should happen around the end of the year. If... If we get those results and they're what we hope they are, based on the data we see, if they're really good, then we'll have to put together an application to the FDA and they'll review it. And that can take a year or sometimes more. So that's the process and that's where we are in it. So there's a second part of that question. Is a generic available? Well, there will be someday. <laughs> How long do you have exclusivity on a drug like Abicamptin? There, you're. This is beyond the scope of what, of what a country doctor knows. Um, you got about a decade. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know the details of that, honestly. Uh, it's a great question. Um, to be honest, a lot of these drugs, these drugs cost a lot of money to develop, um, and you know, there's a period of time when there's no uh, generic. But I, I think the real kind of question behind the generic question is what about access? And if you don't mind, I, I would like to flash, flip this back to, to Lisa and Dr. Marin to kind of ask, you know, what's your impression, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, working with cytokinetics or other pharma companies in terms of trying to make sure that patients can get access to these medicines? How does that work? How's advocacy organization? work on that. It means we don't sleep much, but we're always fighting to figure out where those access points have pinches so that we can open them up again. Um, we've learned a lot in the past year. I have about access and, and the process to getting drugs on formulary, getting them approved through state Medicaid systems, getting Medicare approvals, um, VA, DOD. Like I've learned all kinds of different pathways where people get their medication. And we've been ensuring to the best that we can that patients understand how to operate with a specialty pharmacy. In the transplant world, I'm used to this. If you've never had a very expensive drug, you don't even know what a specialty pharmacy is. And oh, wait until you learn this joy and magic about the delivery process. It's, it's a whole other system within a system within a system that's supposed to keep us safer and control costs, but it pretty much causes a lot of headaches and we're trying to break down the barriers to all the headaches to make it a smooth process. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes, communications with insurance companies that are saying, we, you must do step therapy before using a new myosin inhibitor. I'm like, well, that's not on the label. So we're fighting and we're fighting one fight at a time, but we're building a playbook to know how to uh, argue this. I did not know that many states have laws against step therapy and we have a now a resource and Stacy, maybe you can drop that in the links as well for any clinicians or patients who are interested 
We have a, uh, a great website that lists all of the cover forms that you should use when prescribing a medication that might get kicked for step therapy, meaning you must try something before this drug. So we're learning that whole system and what states have laws already in, in place that we just need to know how to use as the clinician community prescribing, as the patients to ask for the paperwork to be done properly. We're doing a lot on that end. Um, and just the minute I think I fully understand the problem and the process and what we need to do, something else pops up and we have to figure that one out too. So it's going to be still a bumpy road to get to a smooth path for patients to hear, here's my diagnosis, here's a new type of drug, and here's how I get it. But we are smoothing out the path as, as, we, as we're learning it. It's so interesting. It's great. It's great work. I mean, I think, you know, my, my, my immediate thought to that is thank God for this organization and other organizations like it that are doing this work. I mean, one of the reasons that I joined Cytokinetics, Kinetics, and I'm kind of interested to hear from Marty on this too, is, you know, it's really a, a patient first company. And that's, you know, as a doctor, that's what I care about. And we, we have a dedication to making sure right now, our dedication is making sure patients are front and center in terms of helping us understand how to design our trials so that they're appropriate for patients. How to, how to make it so that they're meaningful for patients, how to communicate that with patients, how to get patient feedback on our steering committees and our clinical trial development. Um, but when the time comes that we become commercial entity, hopefully, fingers crossed, and Afghanistan is available for people, we'll be looking to the HCMA and to folks on this uh, webinar and others to help guide us in terms of how to make sure that we get people access. I'm 100% sure of that. What about you, Marty? What have you been seeing in this new space? Well, I think that, um, yeah, I think there's been a number of kinds of challenges to uh, to that um, that that we've seen um, that include, um, you know, I think I was going to make the point that that there's different ways of uh, in terms of access that that have been, or I should say. For our patients, let me back. Let me say for for a lot of our patients, there's been what I've seen more than access issues is sort of a hesitancy to jump into, so to speak, new therapy. You know that, and so maybe that's worth talking just a second about as well. Um, and and of course, it's easy to understand that that new treatments that don't have a lot of evidence behind them over time in terms of both safety and efficacy because they're brand new, relatively speaking, um, can be challenging for patients to, um, you know, get excited about. Um, there's a lot of reluctance there, uh, nervousness, apprehension that surrounds that decision. Um, and I don't know if that's been something you've seen, Lisa, as well recently, you know, or, or not. But I, I was wondering what you've been doing, if you have, to sort of deal with that issue for patients. How, how have you, is it more about education and empowerment that, that you think is the way of getting over that? I think that's a, it's a great question. And kind of to, to go back to what Dan was talking about earlier, you know, I've got a unique vantage point, okay? So I've been the patient, I'm, I'm behind the scenes with the centers, we're working with the patients and we're working with industry. And I've really been impressed with a lot of the individuals I've had the opportunity to work with at many companies, including Cytokinetics. They, they get it and they're doing the work for the right reasons because they want to make our lives better as patients. But doing that is complicated. There's right. regulatory processes to all the regulator people who are watching this afterwards, because we make you nervous all the time, you're all nervous people. Gotta relax. We're all trying to do the same thing. <laughs> I love my regulator people. Um, they always are so nervous to want to make sure everything's being done perfectly well within the confines of the law. And everybody's trying to stay safe, keep the patients safe, and communicate well. These are really difficult paths. Um, I'm, I'm reading a book right now. Um, from the woman who was the head of communications at Pfizer during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic start and listening to how intensely the culture of communication was important to help educate masses on a complex matter. 
Yeah. So like, I'm completely geeking out on her right now. I admit, um, I, she was on the news this weekend and I immediately got the book and I'm like already in. So I think we're much in that same type of a space. We have some newer technology coming. It's complicated. People are nervous because it's new, but it's exciting because it's new and it offers promise because it's new. But how do you pump the brakes, get the data, make sure we're being safe and proceed? And that's where we are. Everybody wants to get to the finish line, but you got to start at the starting line and you got to get there piece by piece, step by step, and you can't skip a step. And that's where we are. And we're having tough conversations and we're communicating and we're probably not doing it perfectly all the time, but we're damn well trying every day. So well, you know, you know what I would like the communication has to be a two way street. And I mean, it's nice for us, nice for, you know, Marty and, and I to be on this webinar and things, but, you know, we want to hear from, I, I, I want to hear from, uh, you know, from patients. Um, and actually, actually, there are a couple <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a segue, but it is. There are a couple of questions that we haven't addressed. In we the have a whole bunch. I'm going to go rapid fire questions because so, okay. there are like 40 questions hanging here. Some of them are duplicates and some of them are quick. Yeah. Uh, Diane, you have your hand raised. We're not going to be opening microphones. You're going to have to ask your questions in the Q&A box. On your mark, get set. This is the rapid fire session. Can Afikampton work for any specific genetic cause or does it work only on specific genetic mutations? We don't know yet. It's a beautiful question. We think, you know, we're not taking patients with just one genetic cause. It's anybody with HCM. So when we get the data, we'll say it works for HCM. Later on, we can start looking. Is there someone it works better for? Should we really focus in this area? But right now, it's anybody with HCM. Is there the hope that we will eliminate the need for metropolol and or verapamil or beta blockers and calcium channel blockers? This is Dr. Marin. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the answer to that, yes, that is the hope that um, we will find ourselves one day um, not having to use beta blocker, calcium channel blockers. One, because, you know, the efficacy of those drugs is not great. Uh, meaning they don't really improve symptoms long-term well enough for most patients, one. And two, they have side effects. Post-myectomy patients, will they be considered in a non-obstructed group for further clinical trials? Um, it's an excellent suggestion. Um, I, will refer, um, I will refer people on the call to the clinicaltrials.gov website. And when our study is listed there. There should be information about inclusion and exclusion criteria for that study. Right. Will people who have participated in another complete HCM related trial be allowed to participate in this clinical trial? Uh, it depends which clinical trial you're talking about. If you're talking about Forest HCM, which is our long term study, and you participated in another Afikampton study, the answer is yes. But for people who are in, say, we're not, you know, for people who are in other studies, um, the general answer is no. There's actually a caveat to that. It's kind of complicated. I'm not going to get into it. And wh whoever asked that question has a specific desire to participate in an Afikampton study and wants to reach out through the medical affairs email that's posted. I'd be happy to get into more detail on that. So my guess is you don't want somebody who's done a previous myosin inhibitor trial, but if they were in the Liberty HCM trial 10 years ago, what about that? They're... You know, um, to be honest, I'm hedging a little bit because I'm not actually sure what's out for public consumption right now or not. Um, so I just need to, you know, kind of table that question and see, I'll get back to you. Got it. Um, I don't quite understand this question. Is this something that would work on familial HCM? I'm I think it's similar to the genetics question is my interpretation, which is that, you know, familial HCM, genetic HCM versus non-familial or non-genetically identified. We don't, Dr. Mar I mean, Marty, we, we've talked about this. How important is the genetics of- the Dr. Marin thing. I, I'm a trying. How important is the, you'll always be Dr. Marin to me, Marty. Uh, so, <laughs> so how important is the genetics? I mean, we know it's important, but how did, what role does it play in the clinical treatment of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yeah, it's a great question. And to make kind of a long story kind of really short, it, it, the, knowing the mutation or knowing the results of genetic testing do not impact in any way management of a patient. So we don't 
decide that a patient should have this therapy because they have this mutation or don't have a mutation or should come back in for an ICD because they have a certain type of mutation. So treatments and also predicting what can happen to patients over time, we don't do that based on the mutation at all. And in fact, in this scenario that we're talking about here, with treatment for obstructive ATM, whether you have a mutation or you don't, you what, what's common between those two groups of ATM patients, they still have the hypercontractile function. That squeeze of the heart is really vigorous. So you'd suspect, we don't know for sure, but we would suspect that treatment that is aimed at the muscle uh, to decrease that vigorous hyperfunction to then have the effect of lowering the pressure, you could suspect would be a, 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 an outcome irrespective of whether a patient has a mutation or not, okay, as well. So that's, I think, that's, that's sort of how I would look at the issue of mutations and treatment here. Okay, I'm going to take somebody who asked a bunch of questions and I'm going to put all their questions together. So part A, if I had a septal myectomy, do I now have non-obstructive HCM, part one? I've been diagnosed for over 30 years. <clears throat> Does the clinical trial participation look the same for a long-term HCM patient as opposed to a shorter-term HCM patient? And finally, did AFI or has AFI shown any reduction in arrhythmias in patients? So, so she's now not obstructed, she's long-term and it has arrhythmias. I could take those. So um, if you've had a successful myectomy, then yes, you can be considered to now be a non-obstructive HCM patient. In fact, that is what you should be um, looked at because that's the goal of myectomy, to eliminate the obstruction and to convert you from obstructed to non-obstructed, okay? And two, um, the second part of that was uh, whether afficanthin, is there any evidence that afficanthin affects arrhythmias? Um, the answer is that we don't know yet. Um, I think we'll have no more information about that in future investigations. Um, the answer is we don't know yet right now. Um, and what was the third one? Um, she's been diagnosed for over 30 years. Is there oh. a different patient profile for a long-term diagnosis versus a newly? No reason to believe based on how long you've had a diagnosis that you would be a better or not candidate for treatments. Yeah. Can, I, can I throw in one a little addendum to that, which is because it kind of like great question. The MAPLE study, we are specifically going to be looking for both patients who have chronic, like you have 30 years, and patients who are newly diagnosed. So within the last year. I, mean, I, I completely agree with Marty, by the way, that we don't have any reason to think that this would be significantly different. On the other hand, it's never really been looked at. So we're going to look at it observational uh, moment of mine in the past couple of weeks. I'm starting to get a lot of people who I talked to back in around 2000, who are now kind of coming back because things were quiet for a long time. And now they're 25 years into their diagnosis. Oh, yeah. Things are starting to shift for them. So I, it, it's an interesting moment where I'm old enough to have been around that long, to have known them when they were asymptomatic and now things are changing. So just Maybe there is something. So maybe to that. this is maybe this is a you know if I could speculate, I shouldn't speculate. I should ask you guys to speculate. If you can speculate, if you could speculate on the potential to use, let's just say afficamptin or study afficamptin in people who are who have HCM but don't yet have symptoms in order to prevent symptoms, what would you what would your speculation be? Would would that be a worthwhile study? Would that be something worth looking at? How you know? Do you, do you anticipate at. that that would make a difference? I think it's worth looking at. I don't know how long you'd have to look though, Marty. Well, I, I think you know. I think Dan, you're you're bringing up a really you know important point and um, one that you know we you know thought a lot about in the community is. You know, should we should we be intervening earlier, essentially, in the in the natural history of the disease, particularly for the obstructed patients? In other words, for asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic patients, you know, is there a case to be made 
of intervening on those pressure gradients to try to lower them as effectively as possible or to get rid of them earlier than waiting until more advanced symptoms appear. And certainly there's a lot of attraction in, in, you know, around that kind of idea. Um, I think up to this point, the most effective way of really doing that was invasive options, which carry risk. So there's been some hesitancy to sort of go that direction. If the drugs, the newer drugs look like they have very confident safety profiles to them over longer periods of time, this idea of bringing earlier therapy to this to, to these patients may become much more attractive and should be studied. So interesting. Super interesting. I think I think just to add something to that and then go back to rapid fire session. There's just something very fundamental about this concept. Your heart isn't supposed to have these excess pressures. Right. The walls are not supposed to beat that hard. Anything that normalizes the functioning of the heart, I believe will prove to be good over time. We know that people who have lower pressures don't develop such things as left atrial dilation as much. And then the AFib comes next and it's this cascade. If you can normalize the pressures on the ventricle, then maybe you stop some of those downstream consequences. That is Lisa's hypothesis, not cytokinetics. Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's, I'm not a, you know, uh, I'm in a way like I'm, I'm just I'm listening. I'm so curious what people think. And again, I want to hear from you know patients on Real this people. call. I mean, th this is like we don't we don't know what we can, right now. Like we need to enroll these studies, right? We need I I need volunteers who want to push the field forward and who want to take not a I don't think it's a huge chance, but a little bit of a chance on this medication. Join these research studies, push the field forward, but. To think, just imagine, it's kind of like when you drive by one of those sciences, you know, the lottery's at 300 million and you think to yourself for a minute, wow, what would that be like? It's kind of like that. It's like, what would it be like if we actually fixed it? It's, it's well, if I win one of those lotteries, I'll buy everybody's medicines for a <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go back will, to that. Let me just add one other point to that, just real quick, but then we'll get to one real quick thing, just because I think it's important and interesting, is that there are patients, of course, for example, that have high pressures, and they live their whole life without any problem, right? They don't develop much in the way of symptoms. They do really well. So I think getting back to sort of how we're going to be approaching these issues in the future, I think one of the areas that's really important is going to be our ability to do better, much better at being able to predict yeah, yeah. which patients yeah. are the ones most likely to benefit from earlier therapy over their lifetime. That's gonna be the real important question, mm. which take a long time to sort of figure out even with more you know, advanced techniques um, and strategies. It's, it's a very difficult question to get at, but that the answer to that will really be uh, one area where we need to focus. Yeah, completely. Back to rapid fire. Could transplant patients trust a drug like this? Oh, this is not for transplant patients. So yeah. once you have a heart transplant, you don't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy anymore. It could be dangerous. But if you're on the path to a transplant, could this be used to help the heart while you're waiting? Uh, I see, Marty. I, I, we don't have any. In, those patients are not enrolled in any of our studies. So we don't have so any I'm data not, on it. I'm going to provide some antidotal information on an N of one. Um, this has happened. And there can be complications if you're on this medication and you go to transplant because of the half-life and the interaction. Well, now this, I, I think I know the case you're talking about. It's not actually this medication. It is not, not it is an inhibitor. It is not apicamptin. Yeah. It's not apicamptin, but th that should be very, very, you should have a very strong conversation with your transplant team while using a myosin inhibitor. We'll just leave it there. Well, um, just also, it's really important. There is no myosin inhibitor yet that's approved for treatment yeah. of non-obstructive HCM. All patients with HCM on the transplant list have non-obstructive HCM. So just to be clear about that, um, well, nearly all have non-obstructive HCM. So okay. at this point, there would be no, it's not approved for that patient group yet at all. Correct. So 
I believe we've kind of answered already. Could patients be on both beta blocker and calcium and channel blocker to join a study? Uh, the answer is yes for maple. The answer at this point is no for sequoia because we've run out of space for beta blocker patients. Right. So it would only be patients who are not on beta blockers. You could be on a calcium channel blocker, but if you're on a beta blocker, you don't have any more room in the trial ultimately for those patients. But for maple, yes, you could enroll in the study. So I am not aware that you are doing a pediatric trial at this time, but is that something that might be considered in the future? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> okay. Um, is this a newer version of Afticamptin or is it the same product since Redwood? Same, completely the same, yeah. Okay. Um, if phase three succeeds, this will potentially be on market when, question mark? I mean, it's the, the, the timeline we talked about before. It's, you know, looking towards to, toward the end of the year for completing Sequoia, then, you know, having to submit to the FDA, which can take a year to review. So you can do the calculation yourself. I mean, we're out, you know, I don't want to put an exact timeline on it, but we're probably at least deep into 2024, if not into 2025. Okay. Um, has there been any common denominators found in AFI or myosin inhibitors in general to non-responders versus responders? Is there any signal that we've seen so far? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, um, so you know, really insightful question in terms of kind of we're asking those kind of questions right now. And so here's the answer: we don't know. We just don't know yet. We don't know what's responsible, in other words, for some of the non-responders that we see in these clinical trials that we've talked about today. And that's an area of active investigation. Dr. Marin, are you running any one of these trials yourself? Well, well I'm the um, I'm what's I'm, I'm the chair, uh, uh, sort of the what we call the chair of the steering committee. So I I'm I am leading. The, co-directing, leading, co-leading, I should say, I guess, um, the Sequoia study that we've talked about today, the phase three study, looking at the effect of Afikamptin in obstructive HCM. If somebody wants to enroll and they are in the Boston area, they can talk to your site coordinator? Yes, yes. Um, will there be a phase three study for non-obstructed HCM with Afikamptin? Yes, <clears throat> keep your eyes peeled. Um, could patients that need a heart transplant try a clinical trial? Well, I think I'm, yeah, I'm super sad about the no answers to that, but go, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Murray. No, yeah, no, I was gonna say, I think that that's a really challenging situation. I think right now um, we don't have any evidence that any of the newer drugs should be used in, in patients that are on the transplant list. Okay. I live in Florida area. Are there clinical trials I can attend? I'm currently taking the tropolol. So there will be, I believe, some sites in Florida. Yeah, we have sites in Florida. The metoprolol for Sequoia, like I've said, is, is a problem now. We don't have any more space for patients taking metoprolol. But again, for Maple, there will be an opportunity and that trial is coming very soon. So hang in there and uh, I think you'll have an opportunity. Keep your eyes peeled for clinicaltrials.gov or reach out to us directly through our medical affairs email. I look at the HCM. Well, email. you can also you can also ask Lisa because she knows just okay. about it. Um, are there potential side effects of Afikamptin, and is there any impact on blood pressure? Uh, th this is a fantastic question. So so far in the data that we have, there are the really main so-called side effect of afikamptin. It's actually the primary effect of afikamptin, which is to try to lower the, the squeezing of the heart a bit. And it does it effectively. We haven't had any serious events. Um, we don't note any serious side effects that are related to the drug. Um, but I, I, I must tell you, um, you know, the purpose of these research studies is to find out about this. And remember, I gave this disclaimer way back in the beginning, you know, this is not an FDA approved drug. We're still in the research phase. So yes, we believe this is so far based on what we're seeing pretty safe, but obviously, you know, it's research. So we keep a close eye on things and anything that we see, we report and we 
take, you know, identify it. I'm going to put two questions together again, because Joe asked two questions. Is there any information on the effectiveness on the septal thickness? Um, is more septal thickness negatively correlated with gradient? That's one part of the question. Um, is there any information on LVOT? Is a more gradient reduction or more severe gradient? So is there an interplay between high gradient and big response or vice versa? Um, and have you seen any changes in, in wall measurements? Well, the, you know, one of, so there's no, first of all, there's no relationship. This is an important point. There's no relationship between wall thickness or maximum wall thickness and gradient. Okay. That it doesn't turn out that way. There's so many other factors that are at play that contribute to obstruction besides the wall thickness that that alone is not associated um, with um, whether or not a patient will have obstruction or not. Okay. So two is that um, that there's no clear evidence yet that myosin inhibitors um, clearly change the structure of the heart, okay, meaning decrease thickness of the of the wall. Okay, we we have some very early small studies that you know show some changes, but I think that's very preliminary at this point. We just don't really know yet what the effects of these drugs are on the morphology of the heart over longer periods of time yet. So I think that's gonna be information that will be coming. The relevance of that it kind of change, if it does happen, will also have to be investigated. So it's not clear either. So there's a lot of work there that's gonna be done in the future, looking at the effects of these drugs on other issues of the heart besides the gradient, okay? Hopefully those, that if the drug does have changes to the heart muscle structure, that that would be an additional benefit. But again, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. So we are heading a little over time. We have a bunch of questions, so we're going into double rapid fire Q and A. So this is the elevator is moving really fast. Answers. Um, we have we have an international population here tonight, and the people of Australia are wondering if cytokinetics is coming to the rescue anytime soon. Any plans for Australia? Um, we don't have any current plans for Australia, although I appreciate the suggestion. Uh, I, will, I will double her hopes for Australia. They need some help down there. Um, this is an unanswerable question um, for the timeline that you have for the double rapid mesh uh, session. Which medication is better, Mavicamptin or Afficamptin? Oh, that's Marty. <laughs> I can't. I can't touch that. Those, those yeah, it's. It. I can understand that question and how and 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 how that can be on 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 patients' minds at this point. But we we have no we have no way of answering that right now. The, the drugs haven't. You know, Afikamden yet hasn't even gone through the end of a phase three study. We we just don't have the information yet um, that would allow for any kind of direct comparison. How are patients monitored when in a trial? Can but I will say. Sorry, I will say one other quick thing, real quick. There are differences between the two drugs. We didn't really touch on this. There are important differences between the drugs. I just want to make sure that we get this point in that um, should be noted. Um, and this is, you know, public information is that Afikamptin has a different pharmacodynamic profile, a little bit shorter half-life, the effects of the drug in terms of the change in injection fraction over doses of the drug are different. Um, than Mavicamptin, and it has a different profile in terms of its interaction with other drugs. It has very little to no drug-drug interactions. And so some of the differences in how the drugs are metabolized may, it may impact differences in, in safety and efficacy of the drug. That's something that needs to be investigated over more periods of time here. We don't know the answer to those questions yet. But there are those different, there are distinct differences that 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 between the drugs that um, are of interest. I forgot to launch the poll at the beginning. I launched to take the poll. Um, thank you for that very diplomatic answer, Marty. And it, it is an evolving, you know, we're going to separate them out. There's a reason that there's more than one drug in this in this space because right. the, the slight changes are are going to have a difference. Which is better for which patient population? Right now, people, choice is really good, and we'll figure out where they each 
have a role and we'll move forward. Um, so how are the patients being monitored? Let's let's look at the forest study. What is the monitoring scheme right now? We know that Camps IOS has a REMS program that's yeah. <laughs> um, what are we doing with forest follow-up? Yep, super on point. Um, so titration occurs over the first uh, eight weeks. And then after that, patients are monitored every three months. There is there is a difference. I mean, I, I'm not going to get involved in comparing Mavicampton and Apicampton, but there's a difference between the REMS program and the way our studies are run, which is that, and it has to do with what Dr. Marion was saying about the pharmacokinetics, unique properties of Apicampton, which is a mildly reduced ejection fraction does not require you to stop the drug in our research studies. You can just take a lower dose and continue on. A very a significantly decreased ejection fraction would, of course, require stop the drug and wait for the ejection fraction to come back up. But those of you who are involved, Mavicampton, or you've been involved in the REMS program, know that if the ejection fraction drops below 50%, you have to take a hiatus from the drug and then restart at a lower dose. It's different the way our clinical studies are designed because the molecule is a bit different. So it's just a you know a feature of it. So somebody was told that the trial is closed at their local center. Is there another study that will be opening soon? Um, or can they go someplace else and participate in that clinical trial potentially? Yeah, I saw that, I saw that question. Um, I, that's a very specific question. And if you can reach out through the email that was posted, you know, try, try to help identify where you can get to and you know try to help you out and see what we can do. Yeah. Additionally, uh, Patty, if you want to just contact the office, we can make sure that you get the answers that you need there as well. Yeah. Um, what is the age levels or lowest and highest for any of your clinical trials right now? Uh, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed. 18 to very old. 75. I can't remember. I, I think it might be older than 75. I I have, I have to, I'm super embarrassed that I don't know off the top of my head the upper age limit. I thought it was listed as 75, but I thought, it? I thought there was some potential wiggle room, but we can get back to you on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Age limit and you have questions. Yeah. Um, ah, Pietro, hello. Will there be an AFI um, SRT trial like Valor? Um, will you go head to head against surgery or alcohol ablation? Well, it's a wonderful question. Uh, we're not going head to head. It's a real great idea for a study is to try to do that. And, you know, Dr. Mary and I have talked about pie in the sky, kind of trying to do something along those lines, but we don't, we don't have that plan right this very second. Um, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see that one of our endpoints for Sequoia HCM includes a comparison of patients who are eligible for SRT at the beginning of the study with those who, those same patients, whether they're still eligible at the end of the study. And uh, we think we're going to have enough patients enrolled who are eligible at the beginning and to, to assess the potential, you know, number of proportion of patients who may not, you know, who may not be eligible any longer, which is really what Valor looked at. So right now we're not planning a separate study to look at that. We think we can get the data from Sequoia. Okay. Anonymous with the really long question. I'm going to hold that one till the end because it's incredibly specific and a little consult via webinar. So I'm going to leave that one to the end and kind of fix that one in a minute. I will address it though. Um, the study coming for non-obstructed, we, we're talking, what, a couple months before Maple launches? Um, we're looking at the first half of the year for the launch of Maple, which is not much longer. Um, and second half of the not year, this. yeah, and second half of the year for hopefully non-obstructive. So that's, those are the general timelines. Any information on alcohol and using alcohol with Affy Campton? Can we have a bourbon with our Affy? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Well, you know, you know, Dr. Marin already pointed out that there's not, not a lot of or mi very minimal drug drug interactions with Affy Campton. And I'm not going to recommend using alcohol, <laughs> but um, Judicious alcohol use within the guidelines from the American Medical Association, American Heart Association, um, is in someone who's not alcoholic, is not contraindicated. It's not disallowed in patients who are taking Afrocampton. On cytokinetics website, it claims, quote, in preclinical models, Afrocampton reverses and reduces thickening and stiffening of the heart, end quote. Is this accurate? And if so, does it reverse with the washout? 
Wow, what a great question. Yes, uh, whatever's on the Cytokinetics website is accurate, stand behind it. Um, and um, I think reversal of the thickening after washout is a question I don't have an answer for. Dan, was that with the animal models maybe? Or, or yeah. Yeah, this is, we don't have this data in humans yet. This is preclinical. And that was the preclinical model, so that's animal yeah. model. Yeah. So, um, and Pietro just texted me. He thinks red wine's better than bourbon. Um, <laughs> is Medicare covering Camzios? Yes, they are. If you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to help you offline. Um, are there resources for finding cardiologists who might treat HCM? And are they up to date with Rx? Um, Joan, we maintain a list of HCMA recognized centers of excellence available at 4hcm.org. If you are looking for a physician and you do not see one on the list, please do call the office. We have programs under development and relationships that we are you know, cultivating at all times. So if it's not on the website, it's really a good idea to call us, ask what's going on in this community. And sometimes we have really fast answers for you. Uh, is the MAPLE trial two-arm study, beta blocker and AFI or subjects randomized? Can you discuss this study design? Well, it sounds like that person really understands the study because they described it perfectly. Two-arm study, randomized, beta blocker versus Afikampton, 24 weeks, and uh, this is rapid fire, so that's my answer. Good. Um, any side effects that have been serious that you've seen so far? Anything that patients should be aware of? I mean, those are two different questions. We haven't seen any serious side effects related to Afikampton. Um, you know, patients should be aware of, of in general, of, of being informed. And our informed consent uh, forms that patients sign as they go into the studies, you know, provide information about any, what we call AEs or experiences that patients have had during the research studies, whether or not they're related to the drug. Uh, but at this time, I mean, the safety profile is good based on the data that we have. Um. There's a very nice comment uh, from somebody who's been in the trial, but I'm not going to read it into the record because it's an antidotal uh, patient experience and I don't want to bias anybody. I might have just done it by saying that out loud, but thank you for sharing your experience. I'm glad it's a good experience. Um, we're gonna wrap up with just a couple last questions here. Um, we got that, we got that. Dan. Wendy says, hi. hi Wendy. What's the relationship between mitral regurg and gradient? Can you treat the mitral valve with a less invasive method if the that way decreases the gradient? Mitral clips and HCM? What? Oh, Dr. Marin, I want to hear this answer. Well, <laughs> well there is there, there the first of all, the mitral regurgitation, the leakiness of blood back to the left atrium is almost always due to, in this situation, is almost always due to the mitral valve obstructing blood flow. So it's a result of obstruction. We consider mitral regurgitation to be secondary phenomenon to obstruction. That's why it happens. And so usually anything that lowers or gets rid of the pressure gradient will also lower or get rid of the mitral regurgitation which is also helpful. Um, in terms of less invasive treatments for the, the, the obstruction that address the mitral valve, you know, there's the opportunity potentially, um, again, you have to discuss this with your, you know, cardiologist, of course, who's maybe taking care of you about whether you would be a candidate for something called a mitral valve clip. That's a catheter-based procedure um, that is occasionally done to relieve obstruction by deploying a clip on the valve, which essentially acts to stiffen the valve in a way that prevents it from bending and touching the septum and obstructing blood flow. So it can be in select patients an option to get rid of obstruction, but there are, it's a complicated scenario. You really have to have a, have a discussion with your, 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 your local cardiologist about that. <clears throat> okay. Um, assuming somebody's in a rural area, are there ways that they can participate in a clinical trial without a lot of complications? Do you make it easy for them? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm glad. I mean, rapid fire answer is absolutely yes. Um, we have arranged with many sites to have patients that even fly in for each visit, stay in a hotel. Uh, we support um, people to participate in their studies whenever possible. So the simple, the short answer is yes, you can do it. Okay, two more technical questions and then we're wrapping. What does washout mean? We've used the term six times, but we've not defined it. Bad mm, ass. Bad, 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 yeah. Wa washout um, is generally means when you stop a medication and let it kind of wash out of your system. That's the, that's the elevator answer. Dr. Marin, any? Yeah, no, I mean, that's right, exactly. Drug gets eliminated from your system. That's the wash out. Is there any indication that myosin inhibitors in general can work on right ventricular obstruction? Wow. Well, right ventricular obstruction is incredibly rare in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, incredibly rare, mostly seen in younger patients. In, 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 when it's seen, in, it's usually younger patients that have excess muscle bundles that obstruct blood flow out of the right ventricle. And therefore it's usually a surgical treatment for that because of that. So the mechanism, in other words, of obstruction on the right side in HCM is different than it is on the left side. Um, so for that reason, if you had right ventricular alpha tract obstruction in HCM, I think it's probably unlikely, never been tested, but probably these drugs may not be the right choice for that situation because it's a different type of obstruction. So the, the last point is actually one that we don't really talk about very much, but I think it's a good way to end this because it, it kind of talks a little bit about where we are in the pharmacolo pharmacologic development stage. Um, somebody said, I'm assuming these aren't orphan drugs. Well, Technically, they kind of are because there's less than 200,000 individuals diagnosed with HCM in the United States, and thereby we get orphan drug designation for development of HCM-related drugs. Um, if you broke them down by genes, they would be less than that number as well. So there are some benefits um, that being an uncommon yet somewhat common, but not really common, uncommonly orphan disease. Like we're in this weird spot in terms of diagnosis numbers. Um, we aspire to not be an orphan disease someday, but we do technically fall there right now. So I, I don't know that there's anything else really to add on that one. Um, so there's been a couple of other questions that we did not get to. I'm going to answer them offline. Um, if, um, uh, if, if, if the individuals want to hang here for a minute when I let the doctors go, go home for the night, um, I can maybe address some of these, but we will formally end the uh, presentation. Um, any last thoughts, Marty? Any last thoughts, Dan? Well, I just, I think it's, in, well, I'll start by just saying, I think, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank all the patients for joining. Um, I want to thank Lisa, the HMA, for the opportunity. I think it was a very, and, and then of course, for Dan and Cytokinetics for coming to the table tonight to do a great overview of the initiatives that they have for treatment of this disease. So thanks for everybody. Um, and I think, look, I, look, I'll say it's a really exciting time. There's been, as I've said before, and as we've talked about on the podcast, you know, there's been, you know, perhaps no greater time in this disease in the last 60 years than right now with the development that's going on in new therapies. Um, that doesn't mean that these are going to be for everybody. That doesn't mean that um, these will represent necessarily a cure, but they do represent an incredible step forward in um, helping a lot of patients with this disease. And what more to be excited about than that? That's an incredible um, step forward for, for the patient community and for, for, for all of us taking care of the patients. So um, I'll just say that, that it's an incredible time. And um, I'll turn it over to Dan. Yeah, I mean, it's I agree with everything you said. And thanks a lot, Lisa, um, for hosting us. Super fun uh, to talk about all the stuff and a real privilege to be here with you and the patient community. Um, and I'll speak on behalf of Cytokinetics to thank each and every individual who's participated in our study, taken any interest in it, or is just here to learn more about it. We appreciate, we're here for you. Uh, we appreciate your support and our, we're, Super grateful to you give us our mission in life and we appreciate it. Um, I, I will wrap with 
I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm in a very unique position where I get to work with amazing corporate leaders and those in the trenches behind the scenes. And there are some really amazing people doing really hard work that maybe doesn't get seen every day. So to the entire team behind the teams at Sino, um, you're doing a great job. We know this is this is a heavy lift. We appreciate everything that you're doing for the patient community and to others who are in development as well. We, we, we are in this together. We have shared goals, shared ambitions. We all wanna live a better life. And we thank you for, for hearing our voice and bringing us front and center to the table. So thanks to Saito for joining us tonight and, and all of the help we had organizing this. And I will say thank you and good evening. I'm gonna stop streaming, but I'm gonna hang here in the room for a few more minutes. And we're...